So I brought a little uh, visual aid this morning. This is one of the gun belts I wore um, as a much smaller, uh, younger man. <laughs> Can you imagine a policeman that skinny? Like, we're talking Barney Fife, only much taller. <laughs> this barely would go around one of my legs now. I was 23 years old, um, working as an immigration inspector in Miami, Florida. Um, that particular belt actually is called a river belt. It's a little bit different than some. Uh, this is before, obviously, there was nylon and those kind of things used widespread. So had a, a buckle on there that you could adjust a little better. Um, the holster on there, um, I don't have my cuff case that I carried way back then, uh, but it was also kind of that matte finish. Now, it's funny, I'm part of the law enforcement generation that was present in the transition from revolvers to automatics. So um, if you're not familiar, revolvers are loaded one, one cartridge at a time uh, uh, or by means of what's called a speed loader. So this held the speed loaders. Um, I also carried, so this thing here, I could pull two of these at a time and, and sequence the rounds and all that kind of thing. Uh, you just learn all of that. So, um, so basically, we carried the old six-shooter. And you advance the next round by, by virtue of mechanical means. So every time you pulled the trigger, 90, 99% of the time, this thing was going to go off or it will at least advance to the next round. Um, most of what you see in law enforcement today, they're, they're carrying uh, semi-automatic handguns and that's loaded by a magazine that's already loaded with cartridges. Um, that's a little bit more efficient. But uh, just a bit of a nostalgia when I got the belt out here, uh, looking things over. I thought I'd explain that a little bit. Now, my, my next gun belts, as an Indiana State Trooper, they were called Sam Brown belts. So, um, like the river belt, they were usually about two inches wide, quarter inch thick, but, but the ones we carried were real shiny, okay? Everything as an Indiana State Trooper was real shiny. And uh, they, uh, the Sam Brown, Brown belt that uh, I wore as a trooper, it had a weird kind of a, a quirk to it, though. Over the years, uh, each one would shrink, and it seemed like the longer the, the, the years went on, the, the shorter those belts would get. So I'd have to get a longer one about, about every couple of years or so. <laughs> the belt carried a lot of equipment. Now, obviously, you can see that uh, when I was fully kitted up on this belt, belt there was no belt showing anymore. Uh, that changed over time. But, but everything anchored back to it. So I had a regular belt underneath that belt, and, and my shirt... Uh, tail would stay tucked in. My bulletproof vest under my uniform shirt was all tucked in. And then the gun belt with all the other equipment on it, uh, as well as, as serving as an anchor, was held onto the trouser belt with, with these belt keeper things. Um, let's see. I don't know if there's one. They've all slidden around. But usually, like, you would keep a couple right there close to, to where the gun would go. Um, absolutely integral to the uniform. The belt was the foundation point uh, the focal point of the uniform. It actually, what's funny is it kind of looks restrictive, and it can be in some, some fashion, but it, it, it provided more mobility and more freedom. Uh, as everything was anchored and had its place, uh, you, you could actually move better with that on than just kind of willy-nilly uh, in, in situations. So it could look restrictive from the outside, but from a very utilitarian standpoint, the, the belt is the absolute indispensable piece of the uniform. Now, the thing is, I didn't wear a gun belt primarily for comfort, but it was definitely comforting to have that. I, I wore a gun belt to be ready for the kinds of battles I might encounter in my mission to serve and protect. So I had various kinds of weaponry on the gun belt. Uh, I had defensive armor that was tucked in and all those kind of things, but I also carried rubber gloves on my belt. I, I had a pocket knife that, that, especially when I was a trooper, that had a blade on it that could puncture metal or, or cut seat belts or whatever I needed to do with it. The belt was an integral tool to my purpose and mission. And it's not made for a day at the beach. Uh, I, I could have never fooled myself that, that I was a day at the beach when I was on duty. It wasn't made for that anyway. And it's not made for lounging by the pool or watching movies, but those aren't things that, that I would have done on duty. I knew guys that would have, but I would not. Um, I wore it to be ready and to be equipped. I didn't hang it in my car in case I might need it from time to time. I didn't leave it at home. I mean, that would have been crazy, right, to leave that thing at home? No, I, I wore it. The Roman soldiers uh, of the first century, they had equipment belts too. In, in that regard, not much has changed since the first century. 
Roman soldiers, so the kind of guys that the folks in the first century would have regularly seen, they would have worn this, this belt called uh, a singula militare, and that was for equipment. Uh, it was to hold their other armor pieces in place and keep them intact in battle. So in this series that we're doing uh, on the armor of God here in Ephesians 6, this, this would have been the imagery for the folks of the Apostle Paul's day. He's talking them through some battle language. Uh, he's going to talk to them about who their enemy is and, and how God has equipped them for the battle, called them into the battle, and he's told them to suit up and to stand firm. And he's telling us the, the, the same thing. The, the battle still rages. The enemy of our souls is still real, and the armor... Praise God Almighty, the armor still works to clothe us and protect us and make us ready and carry us through this life. Now, it's interesting. I think that, that even though we, we immediately want to go to the Apostle Paul, Roman soldiers, that's why he uses this imagery, but actually this, this, this imagery goes way back. This, this is Old Testament imagery too. Um, we see the promises and prophecies, uh, all the tapestry of history and, and life that, that we see in the Old Testament, it all points to Jesus. I mean, that's what we're taught, right? The Old Testament is always pointing to Jesus. That's who it's talking about when it says God's anointed one. Um, sometimes he's called the righteous right hand of God. And, and so if we ask the question, well, wait a minute, I mean, the Old Testament, who's that talking about? Then, then we give the church answer, right? Who, who, is the, who are those things talking about? Well, it's, it's talking about Jesus, Here's some Old Testament pictures of Jesus then that we may not be familiar with. Psalm 24, the King of glory is the Lord strong and mighty in battle. Isaiah 11, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his waist. Isaiah 59, he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. We don't think about Jesus that way, do we? We, we think about Jesus like holding lambs and, and you know, petting kids and all, I mean, all that kind of thing, right? That, that's what we think about with Jesus. But the Old Testament had a more robust view of him. And there's a whole lot more if you, if you get in there and really dig in. So Paul seems to be melding in the, in the mind's eye of his readers the image that they would have been used to in the Gentile culture with also the timeless truth of Christ promised and foretold in the Old Testament as revealed in the New. So I'm going to read our passage here in Ephesians uh, that, that, that we're focusing in on over the next uh, several weeks. So seven weeks now that I'm challenging you to be here each week. And I'm going to read the entire passage, but we're going to focus in on the belt here in a minute. So open your Bibles to Ephesians 6. We're going to start in verse 10. It's God's Word. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having belted your waist with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And with every prayer and request, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be alert with all perseverance and every request for the saints. And pray in my behalf that speech may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel." For which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. A couple of spots here before we get back to the belt of truth, and, and uh, I, I hope that as we work through this, you don't think I'm beating a dead horse, but we really got to understand why Paul is using this imagery. So verse 12, we, we talked last week about the enemy, and it was an overview at best, really. Uh, again, without giving the devil too much airtime, but Paul would not have used this imagery if it wasn't appropriate. So, so this enemy, the devil, manifests himself in all the ways described there in verse 12. And so if you were formerly kind of foggy as to whether or not you're in a spiritual battle, verse 11 tells you the devil has schemes, which should be a good indicator of the type of attacks he uses most or best. Schemes indicate like some kind of deception or lying. 
And then the beginning of verse 12, the word struggle is also sometimes translated as wrestle. So if we don't get our heads in the battle here, the, today especially is going to be kind of an uncomfortable, it'll be informational, but it'll be kind of uncomfortable as a theological exercise. We, we are wrestling against the schemes of the enemy. And they come at us not like a physical enemy. Like, like my old gun belt, this thing would have been useful against those kind of things. Verse 12, what we fight against are the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So this gives us a view that the battle is not only all around us in morality and ideology and worldview, but also within our own hearts. It also shows us that this battle is being fought on a heavenly level, like this otherworldly spiritual plane. And it shows us that there is limitation to the enemy. It actually limits his borders, which is pretty uh, uh, encouraging. That gives me joy. That gives me hope. And all of these personas and places that, that Paul lists are active hotspots in the battle, basically meaning that the philosophies, the ideologies, the worldviews of this present world, and in Paul's day too, they're under the influence of, they're opposed to God's plan for people. We even see it in religion, right? I mean, uh, way back in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, uh, they've healed a guy and, and they get in trouble for it. They're arrested and, and they're told by the Jewish leaders who, who the Jewish leaders, that was more than just like church leaders. These guys were political leaders too. They're, they're religious power brokers and they tell Peter and John to quit talking about Jesus. There was this huge disconnect even within the religion of the day who would have called God Almighty their, their God. There's this weird separation of church and state in the first century Jewish culture there. It was like, it's okay to do good stuff, and we'd like to know exactly how that's happening as long as you're not going to talk about Jesus in the mix. Well, I don't think we have to look too hard to see that at play even in our own culture. In our current age, it might be very akin to what we see happen in our universities or our laboratories or industries or government. Regardless of what side of the aisle somebody identifies with, Jesus has, has been pushed to the, the outer area of the public square, the public conversation. I, I want to submit to you, though, that over, over the course of history, when have we heard the church's voice raise up the loudest? When it's been pushed to the edges. So that should be encouraging for us. We know in the church that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the absolute means of true freedom. It is the only means of true freedom. It is God's mercy received, His grace experienced. And these are the means by which we are freed from this enemy of our souls, this one who would destroy us. And we have to know that, that because that's where our hope is, that's often going to put us at moral and ideological and worldview odds with the structures that are around us. Again, regardless of any kind of political affiliation. In fact, if you don't feel the disconnect between God's way as revealed in His Word and this world's way, then, then I think there might be a disconnect in your engagement of the gospel itself and having God open the eyes of your heart to what He's doing in this world. We often have our eyes shut to this sort of thing. We're lulled to sleep over time, and that's not new. Actually, at the beginning of this letter, Paul prays for these Ephesian people, and he prays at the beginning of the letter, Ephesians 1.18, open the eyes of their hearts and let the light of your truth flood in. Shine your light on the hope you are calling them to embrace. Reveal to them the glorious riches you are preparing as their inheritance. Do you see what the function of, of truth is here in Paul's prayer? It's actually to light the way, so to speak. The, the, the flooding of the light that, that reveals hope and glorious riches as an inheritance. And that looks different than the darkness around them in the first century and the darkness around us today. Sometimes we try to fight the battle and leave the light at home, even though we're fighting in darkness. One of the, the, my most favorite pieces of equipment when I worked nights as a trooper on the road was my flashlight. you got to be able to see what's going on. And that's what Paul prayed here. It's why we can't hope to open our eyes on our own. 
We can't see it on our own. It's why Paul, as Paul said in Ephesians 2.6, that it is God who has seated us in the heavenly places with Christ. We don't take that seat on our own. God does that through Jesus. We've been raised up out of the darkness. And then in 2.7, so that he might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness towards us and Christ Jesus. His truth, God's truth, and, and God's truth alone is able to open our eyes and lights the way to him. This enemy is real. He's dark and he operates in schemes. He's a deceiver. Jesus calls him the father of lies. And God, in great contrast, lights the way for us. And these lies, these deceptions, they're, they're pervasive throughout our culture. And so Paul also says in verse 16 that these deceptions, these attacks, the, these moral and worldview degradations, they're the flaming arrows of the enemy. Again, I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here. I just want us to know who and what we're up against. And that's going to help us appreciate the armor of God, the power of God as a whole, as a representation of our union with Jesus. And then each piece of the armor, that we'll appreciate that so much more, that the way that God has gone before us and provided for us. Now, as I said before, I, I, I wouldn't put my uh, gun belt on for a day at the beach. It, it was comforting, but it wasn't designed for comfort. It was designed for, for, for purpose and for mission. Paul's words just prior to this passage on the armor of God indicate where Paul thinks the armor is going to be needed, where it's going to come into play. And I, and I think it's really interesting that, that if we read basically chapters 4 through right up to this passage, what we find is that... The armor of God isn't, isn't uh, primarily built for the firing squad or a courtroom or when you're getting ready to get your head lopped off. The passage is right before the armor of God were everyday life and everyday relationship passages. The, the, that was where the, we were going to need it the most. That was where we would see it operational, moment by moment, sometimes what we would call the little battles. And Paul seems to indicate that finally, at the, end of the, at the end of it all, this armor was designed for the fiery darts of the enemy in all situations, and especially those ones that are closest to us. Anybody in here ever had kind of a battle at home? A few of you? There's a saying... Uh, and I think it was probably a military saying. It got co-opted by law enforcement or the other way around. But basically living with your head on a swivel. And that means, um, I, I know there's a couple of you in here that know what I'm talking about. You, you know where the exits are. You know, you've looked at the people that have come in. You know who the people are that you uh, are familiar with. And you know the people that you're not familiar with. And you're not necessarily uh, uh, tense in the corner about that. But you're, you're moving in confidence throughout that's what this battle kind of looks like. It's pretty amazing uh, as we work through. I lost my place. That's pretty bad. <laughs> Can I tell you just a brief story as I find my place? <laughs> I've written three sermons this week for today. I now know why there are books and books and books and books written about the armor of God. And so for me to lose my place is not... Not a huge deal. I'll find it. Karen, where am I? <laughs> oh, slide 19. Of course. All right. Sorry. Squirrel. Head on a swivel. The battle is always on. Now, here's the thing. Sometimes we, we, we can get too into the battle and not think about the rest that we have in Christ, that, that we have a Sabbath rest in Jesus. But the thing is, we can only find that if we, if we find our joy in Christ and knowing that He is our only strength, He is our only hope, He is our only salvation, he is, he is mercy and He is God's grace, and they are all and only in Christ. And the battle is always around us. It's always around us. 
So that's just a quick little review of what this passage is talking about as an overview as we're getting into this. We're finishing the book of Ephesians. We've talked about God's grace. We've talked about God's plan and purpose, that we are God's workmanship. We've seen how to live that out in relationships. We've been the recipients of God's wonderful promises and inheritance. We've seen this writing that Paul writes that encourages and builds up. And then we get to this passage and And he starts talking about the devil and the enemy, and it can seem a little scary and a little heavy, but the whole tapestry in the book of Ephesians as we get here is one of God's providential provision for the plight of his people. When we see what God has done and is doing and will do and all to his glory, that's what gives us hope and comfort and joy that the victory is the Lord's. So even as we think about the battle and we think about the enemy, we take tremendous joy and comfort knowing that God's strength goes before us and truly the victory is the Lord's. So Paul says, stand firm in his might, in his strength, putting on the whole armor of God. It's all his. So we can stand up to the attacks of the enemy. We can stand up to the pervasiveness of the enemy's influence. And so we put on the belt of truth, and we put on a belt, we're surrounded by that belt. Now, if I tried to put that belt on, it would not surround me. It it would come up short. But God's truth never does come up short. We are made ready for battle by this belt, the belt of truth. And it's what he starts with, it's what Paul starts with. He, He comes right out of the box with this thing. Think about it. The devil is called the father of lies, right? And and, and in contrast to that, Paul comes out and says, put on the belt of truth. So this belt, this this singulum militari, it holds everything together against the enemy. It is the belt of truth. And, and And all week as I'm writing and I'm writing and I'm writing and I take it to the Lord and I'm like, God, is this ready? Is is this good enough? And he's like, no, no, sorry, son. You need to go back and do this again. And, And I would go back and do it again. And each time I would learn something new. But I would take it back to him, and I'm like, wow, the the question before us is, what does this even mean to put on the belt of truth? But even more than that, I mean, isn't this like one of the most famous questions that's ever been asked? It it was asked by this man wearing one of those singular militares, and he's standing in front of Jesus, and he says, what is truth? Pontius Pilate asked Jesus that question as he's examining our Lord before he crucifies him. So that is the question, right? I mean, we can't put on the belt of truth if we don't even know what it is. And just any old belt won't do for the battle that we're engaged in. Not any old belt's going to hold it all together. Not any old belt is up to the task. The belt of your, of, of your smarts, your knowledge, it's not up to it. You, you, your smarts won't get it. The belt of connections, that's not up to it either. Your LinkedIn account is not going to help you here. The belt of power, whatever power you can muster, it's not enough. In fact, no belt that any of us could come up with on our own is going to help us stand against the enemy. And it definitely won't help us fight him. Only the belt of truth, which is like like all the other armor of God, not of our own making. Thankfully, only the belt of truth is powerful enough against the devil's schemes. So how can we know truth so we can, we can wrap it around ourselves like a belt, an anchor? How, how do we wrap it around ourselves in the first place? Or, or maybe it's God that wraps it around us. I mean, it has to be a pretty solid concept to be useful and foundational. I'm going to insert again here just a minute, but I won't lose my place. So when I started having a lot of trouble with my hip, I couldn't stand to not be in uniform anymore. One of the things that I did to my Sam Brown belt, I took it to a leather shop, and I had them cut it on either side and put in real heavy-duty elastic. But what had I done to the belt? I had weakened it. I had compromised the integrity of the belt because it was actually the belt no longer encircled me. It looked like it did, but it didn't. Keep that in the back of your head. Borrowing from John MacArthur, I like the way he says it. The Old Testament refers to the Almighty as the God of truth, Deuteronomy 32.4, Psalm 31.5, and Isaiah 65.16. And when Jesus said of himself, I am the truth, he was therefore making a profound claim about his own deity. 
He was also making it clear that all truth must ultimately be defined in terms of God and His eternal glory. After all, Jesus is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of His person, Hebrews 1.3. He is truth incarnate, the, the perfect expression of God, and therefore the absolute embodiment of all that is true. Jesus also said that the written Word of God is truth. It does not merely contain nuggets of truth. It is pure, unchangeable, and inviolable truth that, according to Jesus, cannot be broken. John 10, 35, praying to His heavenly Father on behalf of His disciples, Jesus said this, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. John 17, 17, Moreover, the word of God is eternal truth, which lives and abides forever. 1 Peter 1, 23. MacArthur goes on, Remember, Scripture also says God reveals basic truth about Himself in nature. The heavens declare His glory, Psalm 19.1. His other invisible attributes, such as His wisdom, power, and beauty, are on constant display in what He has created, Romans 1.20. Knowledge of Him, this is a biggie, knowledge of Him is inborn in the human heart, Romans 1.19. And a sense of the moral character and loftiness of His law is implicit in every human conscience, Romans 2.15. Those things are universally self-evident truths. According to Romans 1.20, denial of the spiritual truths that we know innately always involves a deliberate and culpable unbelief. And for those who wonder whether basic truths about God and His moral standards really are stamped on the human heart, ample proof can be found in the long history of human law and religion. To suppress this truth is to dishonor God displace His glory, and incur His wrath. There are some who would say there's no such thing as an atheist because God's truth is written on every heart. That's why every heart stands before Him culpable. So then to answer Pilate's question that we were talking about, what is truth? We we only have to look to the one who is truth. The one who has given truth to the world. In fact, Romans chapter 1, it talks about the people who uh, uh, deny this truth. They are suppressing the truth in all unrighteousness. It doesn't say they suppress the truth in all ignorance. That's an interesting thing to think about. The really cool thing is, because that's written on the human heart, when we're talking to somebody about the Lord... Usually we can drive at the real issue, whatever it is, because His presence is undeniable. We're made in His image. So what do we do with truth? How does the belt of truth, uh, God wrapping us in truth, how does that actually work? I mean, He has revealed Himself in His Word. Jesus has said that He is the way, the truth, and the life. He, he, is, he has been truth incarnate. He has been truth walking around. That's what Jesus was. Uh, so that nobody comes to the Father except through Jesus. So what does that mean for us? And I'm primarily talking to those of us who are Christian, who, who know this to be true, who are Christ followers. But for anyone, if, if you find yourself going down rabbit holes trying to figure out what's true, and as Dan was talking about this, well, what's true for you and what's true for you, if you really want to know what's up, if, 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 you're, if you're wondering, if you're teetering on the fence of, do I really believe this, I want to give you three things to think about. And if you do these three things, and I know we don't like that word do sometimes in church, but if you, if you think about these three things, things, if, if, you, if you really work through this, I think you'll find His truth is trustworthy. So what it means for us, it, it means first that the belt of truth is going to be my foundation for pursuing God. It's going to be my foundation for pursuing meaning and purpose in life. So if I'm really going to give this a fair shake, if I'm really going to think it through, then, then I have to allow God to be foundational my truth. I, I can't cut holes in the belt and think that it's still going to work the same. And so for me, if if ideas or thoughts or desires don't square with Him as revealed in His Word, as revealed in the life of Jesus, if the Holy Spirit is, is moving in me to say, no, 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 this is not right, then I answer to the truth of God and I let Him change me. I don't change the, the, the Word of God or, or the truth of God for my own purposes. 
I let him open my eyes. I let him keep me on track with the inheritance and the salvation that he has for me. I test everything against the truth of God. And I don't resist the Holy Spirit's prompting in my decision making. That, that's, where I, that's where I endeavor to be. That's where I want to be. I want to know more of him. I want to learn it. I really want to learn his truth. Now, isn't it awesome that we learn it? We don't earn it. I think sometimes we get that confused. But I learn it. He's already revealed it, and he, he promises to walk with me, and he promises I, I, I put him on. So this whole putting on the armor of God is really just experiencing the union that I have with Christ in salvation. So why would I want anything that was aberrant to come into that relationship? And I know that this side of heaven there will be things, but he's going to help me push those out of my life. So I'm going to learn it. Second, it means that I know I can't be strong in the Lord or stand firm in the Lord without God's truth completely encircling me, the, the belt of truth around me. I have to not only go to it when I think I might need it, but I have to recognize that I always need it. There's never a point where I'm okay on my own. I know me, and if I don't know me well enough, Guyane knows me really well. I have to have God's truth in my life all the time. Because without it, I'm a wreck. I can't, I can't leave it in the car. I, I can't leave it behind when I go to a party or have a discussion or I'm in a friendship with an unbeliever. I, I need it all the time because I, I'm easily deceived by the enemy. I know that. And I bet I'm not the only one in here that's easily deceived by the enemy. So I need it all the time. So I become disciplined about reading it. I, 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 even before I was, I was the so-called professional Christian, standing in front of other Christians, I, I had to read it all the time because my nature is against it. And I'm being conformed to the image of, of Christ. That's what God is doing in me. He who began the good work in me is faithful until the day of Christ Jesus to complete it. And the same for you guys. So... So not only have I learned it, I've learned to lean on it all the time. And third, and probably the hardest, the belt of truth, putting that on, it means that even when it's uncomfortable, it's comforting. It is comforting. And so I allow it to comfort me. The, the belt of truth sometimes feels uncomfortable as, as I navigate relationships or, or just going through this world, but my choice of media and music and, and what I chase financially or relationally. Yeah, we, got a, we got an election coming up, and, and I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but, but I can tell you that sometimes it's uncomfortable working through who God would have me vote for, even in just participating in this world's uh, way of things that go. And, and even in culture, like, like how, how do I act in conversation with people who might disagree wildly with the truth of Scripture? Even when it's uncomfortable, I got to wear it. And I got to let it comfort me. I know that God's truth can feel restrictive. Because after all, when we look around, it's, it's the little kid thing that we used to do. Anybody ever do this? Everybody else is doing it. Everybody else is thinking it. Everybody else says it's okay. Why is it so and so's mom lets them do this or that or the other thing? I don't know about you. Some of you all may have had permissive parents. That argument with my parents, it just didn't go very far. And I think in that regard, you know, we all have some idea of God through the, the ones he's put in place and authority over us. I think in that regard, I have a pretty good a, a view of God, that, that, that as much as God loves me, he's not going to tolerate that kind of nonsense. He's just not. And so I, I learn it. I lean on it, and even when it's not comfortable, I, I trust it. we got to trust it. If we don't trust it, implicit in the word trust is truth, then what are we really doing here, right? And so the foundation of this church, the way that we'll see our communities being changed is as followers of Jesus reflect his love as revealed in his word in truth. If we're going to exist to invite all to Jesus and follow him together, then we got to know what we stand on. And Paul says, man, stand firm in this thing 
in Christ. Stand firm. Uh, God is the one who lets us do that. God is the one that lifts us up. God is the one that puts us on our feet. God is the one that suits us up. But we live here. And so that's what it looks like then to me to put on the belt of truth. Dan, if you and Irina and the girls want to come back up, Make this our prayer this morning. Ephesians 6, 13, Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist on the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having belted your waist with truth. Would you stand with me if you have a need this morning? If you know that maybe you, you don't even know what truth is, maybe you're like Pilate. You're like, what is truth? And he asked it, probably asked it, that's an Indiana thing. He asked it in a, probably a very sarcastic, cynical way, but I think he really was waiting for the right answer. And it was staring him right in the face. And this morning it stares you right in the face. And I would love to connect you to the Jesus who saves, the, the God who is the real truth in this world. So if you don't have that, let's get connected up. And if you've had it, but you cut holes in your belt, let me help you get a new belt. All right? Because I know that doesn't work on so many levels. All right, let's pray together. Dan will lead us. God, thank you for time here this morning. Uh, Lord, your word is... It's so very deep, and we, we try to grasp and communicate it, uh, Lord, in ways that, that we can understand one another. Um, Lord, we are, on this particular subject, um, your truth and the vastness of your truth. In one way, it is so simple. In other ways, it is so deep that I think, God, you've designed us to chase it our whole lives. And I thank you for that pursuit. I thank you for the mission that you have placed us here on this planet for to, to help other people as their eyes are open to the light of your glory, to the, the riches of your grace, to the, the beauty of your inheritance. And as they see it lived out in us, that, that, we, that we have a, a full-on commitment to your truth, but because your truth contains compassion and love and grace and mercy, those things permeate our conversation and the way in which we deal with other people so that they see that the, the only safety, the only beauty, the only comfort is in you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, may we be communicators of that. You have equipped us. You have suited us up. God, give us courage this week to live that out and to fully rely on you, that we would learn it, lean on it, and trust it as holy and right. Your truth is exclusive. It only belongs to you, and you share it with all of us. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.